Running Sentences presents A Cold, Cold War, Part 2, Confusion Reigns. As Evgeny escapes the hands of the British, he finds himself on the run from everyone. This is a work of fiction. Names, characters, businesses, place, events, locales, and instances are a product of the author's imagination or used in a fictitiously silly manner, or just a fictitious one. Any resemblance to actual people, living, dead, or actual events is purely coincidental. The author would also like to apologize in advance for any mispronunciations of names, characters, and places as he's only good with English, and even that is a bit of a struggle most of the time. Copyright 2021, Michael Henry. All rights reserved. Evgeny found himself stuck in the safe house apartment that his Soviet allies had pushed him into for his own safety. However, Timothy and his British allies were all around him and there was nary a sight of any Soviet help. Timothy had completed another lap around the chair which Evgeny sat on, as the Soviet scientist looked rather displeased with how things had turned out. Where his allies were, he didn't know. I want to hand you over to- Ouch! The group all turned to look over at the man who'd yelped, and who was in turn glaring at a cylinder on the ground. A few seconds later, more of these cylinders flew into the room, with the first one starting to puff smoke out of it. We're under attack! Fight back with all you have at the doorway! Timothy and his roguish band of SAS mercenaries slowly made their way to the door. They had to fight their way in smoke that was now pouring out of all of these canisters, and it was not making it easy to see where they were going. Evgeny, however, had stood up and headed over to the window, throwing it open to get some air in. The smoke, however, didn't clear out, and he stuck his head out to find a rickety but usable emergency ladder. Deciding that the ladder was a better option than dealing with the Brits, he clambered out onto the window ledge and then onto the ladder itself. It was not an easy adventure, as the ledge was tiny and the ladder was missing a few rungs on it. Having managed to get the swaying ladder that seemed to move at the slightest movement down and to the alleyway, he did his best to get down the three levels to the alleyway below. He took his time and carefully watched the still open window to see if any of the Brits would poke their heads out and see if he was there, but none of them did. Finally, after several agonizing minutes of looking up ever so slowly and then back down so that he could continue his journey, he got bored and grabbed the sides of the ladders and then, with his feet gripping the outsides, slid downward. A quick descent to the ground and jumped the final five feet to get away from the burning sensation that had cropped up in his hands. Evgeny hopped around a bit as he reached the ground, trying to shake out the pain that had built up in his hands, but... He also realized he didn't have time and rushed down the alleyway towards the road to get away, just in case. Meanwhile, Frank, having escaped the apartment building with no one noticing him, had gotten back to his van and was peering out the window trying to catch his breath from the run down. The car which had carried his associates was skittering off down the road with four guys inside. Out of all of the smoke and chaos, Frank finally spotted Evgeny emerging from the side of the apartment building, coming down a alleyway of sorts. He was looking about and nursing his hands to see if anybody was looking for him. Then, the scientist headed off down the road away from them. Time for us to get out of here as well, driver. Take us back home. The driver did as he was ordered and put the van into gear and slowly began driving away from the scene. Frank kept an eye on the side mirror of the van to see what was going on in the background and just caught sight of Timothy and his group as they emerged from the apartments. They too headed off. However, his, his van turned the corner and he soon lost sight of what was going on with them. Despite wanting to get back to the office, Frank had been caught up chasing down small details of a job moving intel about the country. The, the intel had amounted to nothing, but he still had to chase it down to see where it led, just in case anyone above or below him began asking questions about what had happened. By the time he got back to the office, it was night, and he'd just gotten to the office level where his desk was hidden away when he saw Murphy, his underling, waving him over. Frank adjusted his direction to head over to the filing cabinets where Murphy was standing next to with a folder. The Brits are up to something. 
Well, yes, I know that. I have an inkling that they're planning something, and part of me doesn't want to know what's up. So what are they doing? From what I can tell, a defection of some sort, from what I can tell. But the rumors have it that it isn't a scientist that everyone is buzzing about. Oh, great. Everyone knows the scientist is here. That'll make things fun. Have you told our boss, Cart, yet? Murphy shook his head no, and with a sigh, Frank turned head towards his boss's office. Just behind him, Murphy followed, though seemingly uninterested in what was going on as he was reading the file that was in his hands. They arrived at the door to their boss's office, and the door suddenly opened and Cart emerged. He stopped short when he saw them standing there. Something is up? Frank merely thumbed towards Murphy, who was deeply reading into his folder. A second later, the man realized he was being stared at, and was startled by this. Oh, oh, right, oh, the Brits are up to no good, they have a defection planned, and, and to add to that, everyone knows about the scientist now. What happened to the safe house with the scientist? Confusion, and I think he walked free as a bird, but I didn't pay too close attention, I just saw that he was getting away. The Brits nearly did capture him, though. That doesn't make sense. Frank, why didn't they pick him up? Or did you not want them to pick him up? Or what was going on there? As Murphy pointed out, they're up to something and they're likely using a Yeti, which is why I just caused chaos at the safe house. They got into the apartment before us and they had a Yeti, but uh, it didn't seem they were very interested from what I could hear. Ah, uh, good. Confusion shall rain all around. That's a good call, Frank. No, no side has an advantage of the other, and we all get to eye each other suspiciously. Henry had taken to staring off into the distance like he was thinking about something, and then came back to them. Yes, that sounds like something you should be chasing. Frank, consider that your assignment for now. Keep people guessing about our intentions. Uh, wouldn't it be better suited for Murphy to do that? I have a lot on my plate already. Henry, however, waved away the concerns with his hand as if they were dust in the breeze. We all have our jobs and are overstretched as it is. Plus, if you aren't looking into the scientists and the Soviets or the British find out that you aren't, they'll suspect something is amiss and we don't want that. We can't have that. For now, Murphy will look after the little pet project you had, okay? Frank had opened his mouth to protest, but his boss was glaring at him and then so he shut it quickly. The three then dispersed, heading off in different directions, though Frank was the least pleased. Sergei, on the other hand, had gone home and had a nice meal and enjoying his night waiting for the phone to ring at his home. He sat by his couch and was idly drinking a glass of whiskey and staring out the nearby window when the phone finally rang its shrill cry of attention. Sergei picked it up. Hello? I'm sorry about the late call, but things got hectic and I couldn't get back to my apartment until late. That's fine. Can you tell me if our little job was successful? Did our friend get picked up? Well, two parties showed up at the apartment across from mine. One only came to the door and tossed stuff inside, which caused a lot of smoke. The other party went inside, but from what I could tell, they didn't bring out the person you put into the apartment. Damn, was it the Americans that were in there, or no? It was the very loud British. Great. I've got to worry about that lot now. But I suppose they could work just as well as the Americans. Anything else? Well, the person you put inside didn't come out with the British, but he isn't in the apartment either. He's loose in the city again. Well, thanks for the information. Sergey quickly hung up the phone and stood up trying to figure out what he had to do next. His mind, however, couldn't come to a good decision and he decided it was best to retire to his bedroom and get a good night's sleep to sleep on things. Evgeny had spent the night wandering the streets of Prague, tired and trying to find his way back to his hotel. After a long night of walking this way and that, he finally found himself back in the street which his and Misha's hotel was on. As he passed by her hotel, the door opened and she came out and stopped short. Evgeny, what has happened to you? It was a long night. I don't know if I can explain. You can and will. Come. You look like you could use something to eat. She stepped over to the side of the road and waved down a taxi which came to a stop next to them. 
She then opened the door to the taxi and grabbed Evgeny, stuffing him inside before hopping in herself. The car was soon zipping off down the road with them aboard. The taxi had taken them to a nice little part of town with a little cafe that had an outdoor seated section. They got out of the taxi and were soon seating at the little outdoor section with Misha ordering for the two of them. The morning sun coming down on them rather harshly as it announced that it was going to be a bright day. Misha was heartily eating her meal, but he had taken a rather sad and lost look and was now staring off into the distance and just beyond the horizon. Misha had not let this go unnoticed and pushed his plate towards him. I eat, Evgeny. I, I, I need you to be a strong man, not some simpering fool who is lost without purpose. What's happened? He straightened up a bit and looked a little remorseful at her. Apparently, some people think that they can get me to defect to another country. And the Soviets and my own motherland is trying to protect me, but they, they left me. The Soviet consulate grabbed me and tried to put me in a safe house, but I was quickly found by the British, of all people. What? I barely managed to escape their grasp, but, but that was thanks to smoke grenades tossed into the safe room, and, uh, but I don't know by who it was. Was it my friends, my, my, so, my comrades, or who? I, just, uh, I don't know who I can trust anymore. It's just... What was the name of the person from this consulate that took you to this safe place, and, and why did they? Alexei Victor, I think he said, and he, he took me because he said I was in danger and that people were after me. Well, we shall go directly to the consulate after this to see what is going on. We will see what they have to say. But you must eat first. We cannot have you staring off into the distance, hungry and lost. She once again pushed his plate towards him, and he sheepishly got to eating the rest of his food. After finishing breakfast a half hour later, Misha had decided it would be best for them to walk to the nearby consulate office, as it wasn't far away and the two could easily make the distance. The two set off, but after a few hundred or so feet, Evgeny found himself lagging behind as he was tired from all the walking he'd done last night. Misha came over and helped him along as they hurried towards their destination. It took him a little longer than they expected, but they arrived shortly at the consulate, which was uh, where they found a block of a building protected by high walls and barbed wire sitting menacingly on top of those walls. The only way in was through a gated entranceway guarded by two soldiers who didn't look like they wanted to let anyone enter. Misha ignored this factor and walked straight towards the entrance. The guards, however, stepped in the way. No rebel allowed through. We're residents of the Great Republic of Soviet Russia, comrade. No rebel through. You look check and we don't allow those types through unless they have a work pass. We are not check, you guard. Misha had fished out her ID from her purse and flashed it at the guard. He looked at it and then stepped aside. Misha then headed through the entranceway, but as Evgeny stepped up, the guard once again stepped in the way. No, rebel. You look like rebel. You don't enter. Angered by this, Evgeny stabbed his hand into his pocket and got out his wallet to show off his ID. Once he had it out, he shoved it into the face of the guard who took a step back so he could examine it. After a second or two, he once again steps aside. Now free, Evgeny charges past the guard and heads inside with Misha now trailing behind him. The sparse interior of the consulate lobby matched the exterior of the building. Everything was neat and tidy and well guarded. This time it was a desk and a female guard sitting at the desk that was in the way. The only thing that gave a bit of flavor to the room was the portrait of Lenoid Brezhna that was hanging on the wall behind the guard. Misha and Evgeny marched directly up to the desk. Yes, what can I do for you two? Evgeny opened his mouth and then shut it again. He was unsure of what to say or how to go about saying what had happened to him last night. 
My friend here was approached by a man who claimed to work from the consulate. Uh, this man said that he feared that the Americans and the British were trying to get him to defect and that he was going to whisk him off to a safe house. But then he disappeared and leaving my poor Evgeny here alone in the safe house and then he was attacked. What was this officer's name, miss? Uh, we believe it to be an Alexei Victor. And the guard eyed him for his answer as Evgeny found himself nodding and then slowly reached over for her phone. A slight smile came to her face as she picked up and dialed the phone number. Sergei, once unable to get enough sleep last night, sat at his desk trying to rub the remainder of tiredness from his eyes. It had been a long night of trying to figure out what to do with Evgeny and it wasn't very successful. His phone rang and he automatically grabbed it. Hello? Sir, this is Natasha down at the main desk. We have a couple down here asking about an Alexei Victor. Do we have someone here by that name? Uh, did this couple give their name? A pause followed as he listened to the phone. He could faintly hear some voices behind. I'm Evgeny Kutrov. And I'm Misha Evanov. They said their names. I heard them. Thank you, Natasha. And tell them, no, there is no one here by that name. Send them away and tell the guards out to make sure that they cannot return if they try to. With that, he hung up the phone and then jumped up from his desk. He went over to the coat rack a couple of desks over and then grabbed his jacket. He turned to flee out of the office and only made it as far as the bank of elevators, where he found his boss, Vasily, standing and waiting for another elevator. They stood quietly for a minute when then the ding announced the arrival that they should get onto the elevator that had been called. They shuffled aboard the elevator, trying to get comfortable with Sergei doing his best to signal that he was about to go off and do something important and he shouldn't be bothered. Vasily, his boss, however, glared at him. I heard that Evgeny escaped. Um, well, isn't that what we want? We don't want him. We want him out there and trying to get into the American's hands or the British hands or whoever's hands he happens to fall in. Yes, we want him away from us, but we can't make it easy, otherwise they will suspect that something is wrong. We can't have them think we're up to something. We need Evgeny to fall into their hands naturally, otherwise they'll suspect that we know that they know. Well, um, how close do we need to keep track of him? Because he was not in fact missing, he was just in the lobby and I sent him away. Good. Keep a close eye on him. There is a, a slight situation that might have cropped up, though, with the person that he came with. Uh, she gave a code name that uh, I believe I've seen on a file or two. Then just be careful. The last thing we want is internal investigations coming around. They always find someone to blame and it is never who you want. I'm on it. The elevator dinged once again at the level before the parking lot and Vasily stepped off once the doors opened and disappeared from view. Sergei sighed in relief when the doors closed again and he was headed downwards to the parking lot alone. A few seconds later, when the elevator had announced its arrival and opened its doors, Sergei, in quite the rush, rushed out of the elevator and was nearly across the parking lot when a car came careening through the parking lot, headed towards its parking spaces near his. He jumped out of the way as Dimitri, who was also in a rush, got into his parking spot and then jumped out, and jumped out of his car. Sergey, what's going on? A mess of a situation involving a scientist. The usual then, no wonder I got a call from a few associates inside the department raising questions about people here in Prague. Oh no. Sadly, yes. Can you do me a favor then? I'll get you, into, I'll get you your favorite bottle of vodka, the expensive one in return. Dimitri shrugged and then grinned and nodded. As low-key as you can, find out if there are any secret KGB people working in Prague that don't report to us, and find out if someone is running an operation here that we don't know about that we should. I'll see what I can find, but, uh, when they don't want to be found. Dimitri offered a shrug and Sergei simply nodded as the two passed each other, Sergei jumping into his car as Dimitri headed off towards the elevator to get to work. Once in his car, he abruptly got it in motion and, with a screech of tires, headed towards the exit. 
a short ways away from the Soviet consulate in a building made to look as nice and as unstandoutish as possible, was the British secret base of operations. Though everyone seemed to have an idea that it was there, but no one bothered to mention it to anyone else. Everyone believed everyone already knew. Sinclair sat in his office on the fourth floor, staring up the door waiting for it to open, which it then promptly did, and Timothy came in looking all sorts of sheepish. I've heard a report that your operation was a failure to secure our target. Uh, yes, sir. It got out of hand and we failed to secure the lost soul named Evgeny. That doesn't sound as simple as you made it out to be in your report. But never mind. We don't have time to waste. We need to prove to our sources that we're capable and ready to handle their requests. Get back onto Evgeny as quick as you can. And come up with a more efficient plan. I don't want to hear about any more failures. Uh, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Timothy, who had never fully entered the office, stuck back out of the door. Sinclair went back to spacing out as he watched the door. Since leaving the Soviet consulate, Evgeny and Misha had spent the morning wandering about Prague under the watchful eye of Sergei. But he had taken a small interlude as they settled in for lunch at a cafe, call a friend and also sit down for a few minutes. He soon found himself enjoying a meal while waiting, which didn't take long after a gruff-looking man in the usual uniform of a detective of not quite good enough clothing came over and sat across from him. Well, Mr. Sergei, what is it you called the police for? Yarmir, 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 I have a situation that needs looking into, and you, my dear friend, are the only one I feel I can ask to do this. I am not your friend, Sergei Petrov. I am not at your beck and call, so this better make me look good. Now what is this you want? I give you a choice. You can crack an international spy ring operating in your country in your very city or catch your usual lot of murderers for both if possible sergey a smart man you are mr yarmir there is of course potential to catch both at the same time and we do have good luck with that i believe you have u.s agents and british agents in the city, acting of their own accord, trying to grab defectors from my country. This is what you want me to look into. I'll never get any credit for any of this if anything comes of this. You do know that. Besides, I'm sure that everyone is aware of them already. Yes, well, it seems that they've been active lately, and it's getting dangerous for everyone. I had to save a scientist, a vacationing Soviet scientist, from their clutches, and I just thought I'd warn you that they are active, and they might be into doing things loudly soon. Sergei rose from his seat at the little cafe table and threw a few rubles onto it, and then headed out. Yarmir glared after him for, before standing up himself and stuffing his hands into his pockets and heading the opposite direction. Having spent the day wandering the city and trying to calm Evgeny down, Misha was growing tired of babysitting him, but because she didn't want to see anything bad happen to him either, she stayed with him. So she'd taken a day just to be with him and explore the city, and they now found themselves at Latna Park in the evening. They were walking along a pathway in the park, and they both seemed to keep looking behind them to see if there was somebody there. Are we being followed? Evgeny. You have had a long day. Your mind is jumping at this. Why don't you go back to your hotel and good night's sleep? He instead pulled away from her and headed towards a bench, which he sat down on. I'm allowed to jump at things after the day I've had. Besides, the people that tried to grab me yesterday probably already know about my hotel. I should stay with you for a day or two. She turned and looked down the pathway, trying to come up with the words to help him as she sought out to see if there was somebody following them. I can't have that, Evgeny, and if they know about you, they probably know about me, and my job won't allow me to keep people at my hotel room. However, as she turned to look back at Evgeny, she found the bench where he was supposed to be empty. She paused and listened as a heavy rustle came from the underbrush behind the bench. This was followed by what sounded like a little bit of gurgling, and then quiet. Evgeny? 
There was a bit more rustling, and it faded away as it seemed to be heading away from her. Damn, I want him to go away, but I need him around. She then hurried over to the bench and looked around to see if she could see through the thicket of underbrush. But since there was nothing there that she could see, she found herself rushing into the thicket. Misha ran across the park, catching snippets of a man holding another man. She pursued them with vigor, but the two managed to reach the road and jump into a nearby van. The van was mostly gone by the time she got to the road. Shite, there goes my plans dramatically. She glanced around for a taxi, but none appeared, leaving her to hurry down the sidewalk in search of one. A van skittered to a stop in front of an office building. This was the one that the U.S. was using as a front for their work. A few men jumped out of the van, heading around to the back, which they opened. After a few seconds, the men emerged from the van with a chair and a man tied down to it. They placed the chair facing towards the guard of the building and then hurried back to the van and drove off. A guard came forward a few feet to see what it was that had been dropped off, and when he got within sight of the gagged and unconscious man, he stopped. Having seen enough, the guard ran back inside the building to fetch someone to deal with the matter. Across town, Frank, happy that he had managed to get a night off and relax, was staring out of his balcony when a sharp shrill rang from his apartment doorbell interrupted him. He glanced over the doorway as it rang again, and he slowly went over and opened the door to find a delivery man with a message that needed to be signed for. The message was soon in hand, and he opened it as he closed the door, and he pulled a face at the message when he saw it. He then grabbed his jacket from the coat rack. They should have just called me instead of sending this message in a roundabout way that our friend had been dropped into our lap. He wound up shaking his head as he shrugged away into his jacket and then a few steps towards the bedroom to talk to his guests. Uh, I have to step out to deal with some matters. You two can continue to enjoy each other's company. Sorry, I won't be able to have some fun today. Back towards the door, a female emerged from the bedroom followed by a man. He simply waved to them as he stepped out of his apartment. A short while later, Frank pulled his car into the underground parking lot not far from the office that they were using as a front for their operations. He lazily circled his way around until his headlights arrived at the sight of a collection of cars and a van off into an abandoned corner. As Frank pulled his car over, his headlights highlighted a man sitting on a chair that was just out in the open. With a shake of his head, Frank got out of his car and was approached by his associate Murphy. Why is the man out in the open for all the world to see Murphy? Well, he isn't out in the open, open. No, he isn't. But he is out in the open, and it's the dead of night, which means that the British, the Soviets, and the Czech secret police wonder about looking for idiots being idiots so that they can do something about it. Sorry, sir. Well, we all have our moments. I know I've had my share of mess-ups now. How do we get rid of what we don't want? How did we get him, and when we didn't want him? This one showed up to the office front entrance tied to a chair like this. Dropped off by a van. Don't know who did it. Great, just great. But also usable, I think. Is there a payphone around here? Murphy pointed off towards the corner and jerked his head in the direction as well. Frank headed over and entered the sorry-looking phone booth where he picked up the phone and pulled out his trusty contact book. After looking up the number, he dialed it into the rotary phone one number at a time with a pause to let it reset each time. The sound of the phone line picking up at the other end alerted him to what was going on. Hello? Timothy, how are the British operations going? Well, good, or just indeterminate since we don't actually talk about that. Never mind, I have a gift for you. What? Frank, why are you calling me late at night? I figured that you and your boss would like a nice win for the British operations. Thus, the gift. Plus, I heard you and your team are chasing something big, so a double present for you right at your apartment doorstep shortly. Wait, what? But Frank had hung up the phone and stepped out of the phone booth. Upon exiting the booth, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a flask, which he took a deep sip from. Murphy approached, looking at him questioningly as Frank offered him a sip. Not one to turn down a drink, Murphy took it. We all set, Murphy? As Murphy took a slug, he flinched from the substance with a shake of his head as he handed it back. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. What are we doing with him? 
I think the British need a good shakeup. Timothy Miller, for instance, seems to be up to something, as you told me. And it's time that we get to know what they're up to, and we can do that by pushing this one over to them to see what happens. If you could get the troops to follow me in the car, we are about to go drop him off. Yeah, sure, I'll go do that. Frank took back the flask and tucked it into his coat and headed towards his car. A few seconds later, his car was leaving the van out of the underground parking lot. Timothy, on the other hand, was now pacing about his apartment ever since Frank had called and woken him up. The simple, understated living space provided a lookout for the road below. It was the only road up to the apartment building, and if Frank was going to show up with some sort of surprise, it was best that he could see what was going to happen. He made another lap around his place, biting his thumb now. What surprise? Is there a surprise? Do the Americans suspect something with us? He proceeded over to the couch to sit down and think. The strain of it all and the thoughts about being discovered in his secret operation going up in smoke overloaded his mind. He took a few deep breaths to calm down and think. However, as he closed his eyes, he found himself falling asleep. The morning rolled its way around with Timothy fast asleep in his apartment. Down on the road outside of his apartment, however, a car followed by a van pulled up outside of the entrance. Frank got out of the car in front and watched as the group in the van got out and then brought out of Guinea, still tied to his chair and unconscious. The scientist was then plopped down in front of the apartment building. The group then rushed back to their van and headed off as Frank waved to them. With them gone, he turned and looked at the building, and then reached into his car and pressed down hard on the car horn. With a start, Timothy jumped up from the couch and shook his head. The bleary early morning sun cast its glow into the apartment in its roundabout way. He glanced about himself, realizing that it was indeed morning, and that the sound of a blaring horn from outside was what woke him up. He hurried over to the window and opened it so he could stick his head out and see what was going on. There he saw Frank standing by his car, who then let up the, on the horn and waved to him. What's going on? Frank merely pointed towards the figure in the chair near the entrance and then got into his car and drove off. Timothy watched him for a second and then turned to look at the figure that was sitting on the chair. Curious and worried, he abandoned the window and headed for his door to find out what was waiting for him below. Emerging from the elevator, Timothy scurried over to the front entrance, and once outside, he went over to the man sitting slumped over on the chair with the note on his lap. He snatched up the letter and carefully looked it over. Dear Timothy, sorry to deliver this present at such an early hour, but it's what you get for trying to run operations secretly. You should know that we always find out things. And if we know, then the Soviets know. Good luck with Evgeny Kucherov. Sincerely, Frank Gordon. He glared at the note for a few seconds and then crumpled it up and stuffed it into his pocket. One of the neighbors, having come out of the apartment building, stops and stares at the sight. Oh, go away! There's nothing to see here. The neighbor scrambled off, casting a look at Timothy, who had moved around behind the chair and grabbed it to drag it inside. He'd made it as far as the lobby of the apartment building before being forced to wait for the elevator without anybody seeing him. He could have taken Evgeny up the stairs, but lugging a man and a chair up three levels did not sound like much fun. Thus, he was waiting for the elevator and doing his best to ignore the stares of anybody who came by. The elevator quietly arrived when the door was opening and a few neighborly people coming out. They glanced at him and then Evgeny and then back at him. He had a rough night. Uh, I'm just doing him a favor. Move on, please. The people didn't look like they bought what he'd said, but they ignored them, and he dragged the chair onto the elevator. The ride was a short one, and he managed to get Evgeny back to his apartment with some trouble, but no one bothering him. Soon he dragged the chair into his apartment, setting it up by the sofa, and then promptly collapsed with tired arms into the sofa. Taking a moment to relax and regain his composure before sitting up to pick up the telephone near his couch. He ran his fingers around the rotary dial, calling up the switchboard at his office. Hello, Op Center. I'm glad I got through to you guys. Listen, I need Sinclair to come down to the Battle of the Roses right away. We have big things that need to be seen. With that message complete, he hung up the phone and turned to look at Evgeny. 
the man with simple, taunt, and seemingly never-ending lines of worry about him. He also appeared to be twitching, which Timothy took for him to be waking up. No, 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 you're not to wake up, Mr. Evgeny, at least not right now. He then hurried off towards the bathroom, room, hoping to find some way of peacefully keeping the man asleep. Several blocks away on the road sat an unmarked car, which happened to have the detective Yarmir in the driver's seat. Next to him was Sergei, with some folder that he was trying to keep Yarmir from seeing. Sergei Petrov, I have no interest in your secret files, though if I knew anyone with connections to the secret police, I would tell on you. Now I called because I have found something interesting for you. Are you trying to be coy? It doesn't suit you with your statements that have about having found things out. Get straight to the point. Please, Sergei, you can't ask a simple detective like myself to wander into a world of espionage and then start talking straight. That's like asking for my head to be chopped off because I said the wrong word. Sorry, I didn't mean it that way. Shh, I'm sure you meant it exactly how you said it. But my report is that you have multiple defectors trying to cross over to the British. The British? Are you sure that it was the British and not the Americans who were after the defectors? Positive. And multiple people. I know of one who was trying to get a hold of, but another and maybe more than that. This is going to be trouble. Sergei opened the door to his side of the car and stepped out. He seemed troubled but leaned back into the car a second later. Uh, thank you, Yarmir. My bosses shall know about this and I'm sure that you will be rewarded well by the police for your work. He snapped the door shut, leaving Yarmir alone to start his car and head off for his day of detective work. Back at Timothy's apartment, he was growing tired of listening to Evgeny swear at him in Russian and had mostly tuned out what he was saying. He stared at the door waiting and hoping for the sudden knock to at least give him something else to worry about. Then a heavy knock hit the door and he bolted over to it and popped open the peep sight for the peephole and stared through it. He saw an awkward and slightly chubby Sinclair standing there on the other side. With that knowledge firmly in his mind, he pulled open the door and ushered his boss inside. Thank God you got here quickly. Yes, I got here, Sinclair. What is the matter? Timothy pointed over to Evgeny, who had fallen silent, but this was because the chair had tipped over and now lie on his back. Sinclair, curious, walked over to look down at what Timothy was pointing at. Oh, good, we finally have him. I am Evgeny Kucherov, scientist for the Great Soviet Republic. I protest this treatment. Yes, well, protest away, Mr. Kucherov. What do you want to do with him? Give him to the Americans. Timothy, we have no use for him. Uh, that would be a problem, sir. Why? Um, he's how we got him. The Americans are how we got him. And what is going on? Why am I being passed around by people? And will someone please stand me up? How did I even get here? He's been going on like this between swearing at me and Russian. Uh, so I repeat, what do we do, sir? Sinclair bent down and picked up the chair so that Sergei was now sitting upright and then stepped back. Mr. Kucherov, do you know where you are? In the clutches of the hated British. Smart man on some level. He paused and stepped off to the side where Timothy following him and they lowered their voices. We can't keep him. But my other plans... Well, you need to learn to adjust, so adjust. If the Americans and Soviets suspect something, then we have to act quicker and throw them through a loop. Just get rid of this one first. Evgeny, who was listening, and because their voices were not that quiet, knocked his chair slightly to the side, but not over. If you free me, then I will do all in my power to help me, you, whatever plans you have. But only if we do a handshake. You can't go back on handshake deals. Sinclair looked over at Timothy, who with a sigh and a shrug headed over to untie and get the handcuffs off of Evgeny. A few minutes later, Evgeny now found himself free of the British grasp. He wandered out from the front entrance of the apartment building to the sidewalk. He was casting looks every which way to see if somebody was around, but 
Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, he set off down the sidewalk, hoping he could find Misha's hotel soon. Also, he that he could see her. As he headed off, he promptly forgot that he was supposed to be looking out for things, and had he been paying attention, he surely would have noticed that shortly after he'd set off, a man in the usual espionage outfit of a low-brim hat and a trench coat come sauntering in the same direction that he was headed. Having managed to make it all the way back to the front entrance of the hotel where Misha was staying, he looked at it and then around, noting nothing particularly strange, and headed inside. Upon getting up to Misha's hotel room, Evgeny found the door and knocked on it, but it was slightly ajar. He was in a better mood and things would be good when he saw the love of his life again. The door opened a slight bit further with the knock, and there was no response, so he pushed the door fully open to take a step inside. Misha, are you there? There was no response, and he pushed the door fully open to take a step inside. Misha, are you there? It was then that he noticed what would look to be a pair of feet looking ashen and drained of blood. He took a step back and then a step forward. He couldn't figure out what to do when the sound of an elevator, which was close by, alerted him to the fact that people might be coming. Misha? When no response came and the pair of feet just remained looking terrible, fear overtook him. He slipped out of the door in the hope that it was all some sort of mistake, just that it was a mistake that he wanted no part of. End of part two. Thank you for listening.